Okay, we're studying the gospel accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John as we harmonize those four gospel accounts together. Uh, we use this material primarily from a book called The Fourfold Gospel, which was written by W.J.W. McGarvey and Philip Pendleton years ago. It is still in print. If you'd like to get one of those, you can. But we were leaving off last week. If you uh, have an outline with you still, we left off at Roman numeral 4, letter... Oh, I'm sorry, Roman numeral 5, rather, letter A, where we were studying Jesus healing a man on the Sabbath day from John 5, verses 1 through 47. And we're ready today to pick up there at verse 30. So let me get there open as well. John 5, at verse 30, is where we will begin this morning. Last week we were talking about the resurrection. Jesus said, The hour is coming, and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. That's verse 25. And then he talks about verse 29, though, or 28 and 29. Then he says, Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. Those are obviously the ones who will be saved. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. That's verse 29. Obviously, those are the ones that will be lost. So when the resurrection takes place... And when will that event take place, by the way? When, what else is going to go along with that? The return of Jesus, and of course, once the resurrection's over and uh, all the souls are before the judgment seat of Christ, judgment will take place. It will commence. But nonetheless, that is what we find there in John chapter 5, verses 28 and 29. Now let's go to verse 30. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just. Because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. And again, we go back and we look at verse 22 of this chapter, keeping in context that we've already studied this, and he's already made this statement. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son. Jesus is the judge. We appear before the judgment seat of Christ. And again, I'm grateful for that because he is the one of the Godhead who put on flesh, John 1, 14. And it is he who has lived as a man and been tempted in all points like as we are, yet without sin. So we do not have a judge that can stand before us and say, I don't have a clue what it must have been like to be a human being. He knows exactly what it's like. He knows how it is to endure those temptations and never to fail in them. So when we come over to verse 30, he says, as I hear, I judge. He doesn't do it all on his own, and my judgment is just. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe we are getting more and more away from what true justice is in society. We have gotten to the point where punishment is no longer being dealt out primarily. It is now considered to be rehabilitation most of the time. Please don't misunderstand me. I understand there are some people who have instances and situations in their lives where they can be rehabilitated, where they can have someone help them along the way and nurture them along the way, and they will change, and that's a good thing. But friends, there are also some people who need to be punished for what they do. And it's just the honest truth. They need to be punished for what they do. They need justice brought upon them. A murderer who is out there killing someone innocently, uh, uh, kills an innocent individual, he needs punishment brought upon him. And therefore, justice needs to be served. Well, Jesus is, in his judgment, just. Uh, there will be an ultimate justice on the day of judgment. Now, I, I say that, but keep in mind, there's going to be a whole lot of mercy being dealt out that day, too. Because none of us are going to be found righteous in his sight without the mercy of God. It is through his mercy that we have the opportunity to know his will and to obey the gospel and to live faithful to it. But those who reject the gospel and those who refuse to obey God, they're going to have justice brought upon them. And it will not be, well, wait just five more minutes and I'll get it right. It's going to be just at that moment in time. His judgment will be fair, it will be right. Because he says, I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. That was what he made clear on more than one occasion. He didn't come to do his own will, he came to do the will of the Father. Uh, someone read for us, if you will, Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Matthew 7, 21 through 23. Whoever gets there first and doesn't mind reading. What was it that they failed to do? The will of the Father which is in heaven. What did Jesus come to do? The will of the Father which hath sent me. Jesus is the absolute perfect example of knowing the Father's will and obeying it. And he is the one that we ought to emulate and follow in every aspect when it comes to obedience to God's word. Is there anything in which he failed? 
You know, can you believe that there is actually a very prominent and well-known doctrine amongst the denominational world that actually, when you get down to the bare bones of the doctrine, it implies that Jesus failed? I'm not kidding. Have you ever heard of premillennialism? Uh, the idea that Jesus came to set up an earthly kingdom and the Jews rejected him and therefore he failed in his mission to set up the earthly kingdom and instead he set up the church. The problem is people don't understand the kingdom and the church are the same thing. Jesus didn't fail in any aspect whatsoever. And therefore when you think about that, that's a, that's a terrible doctrine. They're telling us that Jesus, God in the flesh, failed. No, our Lord was perfect in everything that he did. He never failed in anything that he did. So he came to do the will of the Father, he did it perfectly. That should be the way we strive every day is to make sure we're doing the will of the Father. Not our own wills. That's where we have to bend our wills. We have to be willing to submit to Him. And that takes a conscious effort on our parts. We're not inherently, if you will, programmed with that per se. We have to learn that. And we have to be willing to do it. Jesus was Himself. Now, He also said, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. Now, what does He mean by that? Remember, he's living under the old law of Moses. Is that correct? Under the old law, was one witness sufficient? No, it had to be more than one witness, or the, the, so, uh, the witness was not accepted. He says, if I bear witness of myself, that'd just be himself, one witness. My witness is not true. But he has more than one witness. Look at verse 32. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know that that witness which he witnesses, witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John and he bear witness unto the truth. Now, which John is he talking about here? That's right, John the Baptist, or a mercer, the one who was baptizing in the River Jordan, preaching, repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So therefore, John was a witness unto to the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He, that's John, was a burning and shining light, and ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. Remember, all the Jews in Judea and Jerusalem, they came out there to be baptized of him. Now, some rejected it, but he was very popular there for a little while. And when I say that, I don't mean that to be in a degrading sense. What I mean by that is he had a lot of people listening to him, and a lot of folks were obeying being baptized, which was a new thing for them to do. And for a while, yes, they rejoiced in his light. But remember, he had foretold something, John had, that there was one coming after him who was preferred before him, right? Who was that? That's Christ. So did John bear witness of him? Yes, he did. Didn't he say, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world? He certainly did. He bore witness unto the truth. But I have greater witness... Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, brother. Yes, sir. Absolutely. The Spirit was the same way in that regard. Uh, he, what he heard is what he revealed. And, and the same being there of Christ. That's right. In regard to what he came to do, the Father's will. And similarly, the Spirit did with Christ. That's right. Uh, it, it, what is the New Testament? We were commonly refer to it as the law of what? Christ. That's right. But who was the one who revealed it to mankind? It was the Holy Spirit. That's exactly right. You see the, the work of the Godhead in the perfect harmony with those three as well as you go through here. They never would have contradicted one another. They never would have had an issue with one another and those things. So keep that in mind as we go through here. But Jesus then goes on and says, But I have greater witness than that of John. Now remember the Jews, by and large, there for a while, they rejoiced in his light. They, enjoyed, they trusted John to a degree. A lot of them did. But Jesus says, I have greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. What was, one of the, what was the thing immediately in this context in John chapter 5 that he had done that caused the uproar to begin with? What was it? In the context here, it was, that's part of it, yes. Okay. There was actually, in this particular statement here, it was the healing on the Sabbath day, the fact that they didn't like that, and the fact that he had made himself equal to God because he claimed to be God's son. And yes, uh, 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 and the one you were mentioning there, Brother Bohannon, um, what was it? I'm sorry, what was it you said? Oh, yes, the forgiveness of sins. Right, we've seen that already as well. That he's been able to forgive man's sins. Not only was he able to heal physically, but he was able to give the forgiveness of sins to that man who was sick of the palsy. So when we come down through here and we see him saying that these works that he does, they bear witness of him, 
Certainly they did. These are not just common everyday works that he was doing. These were supernatural, miraculous events that without the will of God, without the power of God, it wouldn't happen. So therefore, he's no charlatan. He's not one of these that you see on television who says, send me in your money and I'll send you this thing in the mail and you pray for it and you'll be miraculously healed or whatever. He didn't do like that. When he did it, it was miraculous, instantaneously, immediately, and it was legitimate. And therefore, Jesus says, those works, the same works that I do, bear witness of me that the Father has sent me. But before we leave this, there's something else I want to bring out. There are other works besides the fact of the supernatural, miraculous things he was doing. The preaching of the word that he was doing as well as a work. So when you think about the works he was doing, this they bore witness of him that the Father has sent me. So if I'm not mistaken, you have Jesus as a witness, John is a witness, the works are a witness. So under the old law of Moses, does he have sufficient witnesses to back up his claims? Yes, he does. That's true. That's right, Matthew chapter, well, John, Matthew, rather, chapter 3, and then later on in Matthew chapter 17 at the Transfigura- Mount of Transfiguration. Did it on two occasions. So, yes, the Father bore witness of the Son, absolutely. As a matter of fact, you'll see there in verse 37, and the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. So what are we up to now? That's four. Sufficient witnesses under the old law? Yes. So guess what that means? The Jewish people were without excuse when they did not accept what Jesus taught and what he did. They had no reason not to accept it. Under the law of Moses, it was fulfilled the way it should be. The witnesses were adequate and in number enough. And Jesus performing the works, the miracles that he was doing, was confirming every message that it was going out of what he was preaching. They were absolutely without excuse. Now, let me say this too. Do you believe all those things that he did? Are you confident in those things yourself with the witnesses that were given? We're without excuse too then. We have no excuse if we reject our Lord any more than the Jews did. And therefore, we need to be ones who uh, accept what we read because we have the, the truth there being revealed to us in God's Word. All right? And the Father himself which sent me, has sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his shape. No man hath seen God at any time. John 1, 18, right? How do we equate that? What does that mean? Because a lot of folks saw Jesus in the flesh when he was here on earth, Right? So how did no man see God at any time? The spiritual sense. God is spirit, John 4, 24, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. No one has seen God's full spiritual form. The closest that man has come is probably uh, the Mount of Transfiguration and perhaps when Moses saw the hinder parts of God pass before him. Other than that, that's about as close, I think, that man's probably come. Maybe outside of what John as well was revealed, to, or what it was revealed to him in the book of Revelation, but that's about as close as we get. Yes, that has to do with the spiritual side, because God is spirit, John 4, 24. The physical part is not what was made in the image of God. It's the spiritual. And therefore... He breathed into the nostrils of man the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Absolutely. So we have the situation here that no man physically has ever seen the spiritual fullness of God, right? Except for one. The son who was in the bosom of the father, he hath declared him, John wrote. Keep that in mind, but none of them ever had in that regard. Of course, Jesus being the exception of that because he being God was in eternity with God before the father before he came here. So that is obviously the exception of that. None of them, though, have seen him Neither have they heard his voice. And ye have not his word abiding in you. Now, friends, you, you, are, you know the old adage of what it means to cut to the quick, right? What does that mean? If I say something to you and it cuts you to the quick, it cuts you deep, didn't it? Okay, good enough to bleed. It's, 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 it's hard to deal with. It's not easy to accept and handle. Ye have not his word abiding in you. He cut them to the quick. I want you to think about what he's telling these folks. This is... The Jewish people who have believed for all these years, we are the people of God. We are God's chosen people, the nation of Israel. Jesus says, you have not his word abiding in you. Friends, if we don't have the word of God abiding in us, are we truly God's people? Here's the thing about it. The Jewish nation was going to endure because Jesus had to come with the seed line of Judah. Therefore, the Jewish nation was going to endure for a while. By the way, eventually... That Jewish system was going to be completely done away in AD 70. It wouldn't make a difference after that. Now, with that being the case, 
They were the ones, yes, who had the opportunity to have the Old Testament scrolls. But you know what Jesus said? Not only, and we're going to find it, it's in the very next verse, or not the very next one, uh, I'm sorry, it's verse 39. In the very next, well, no, it is the very next one, we're in 38. The very next verse, read it with me. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The Jews literally thought, we're the ones who possess the Old Testament scrolls. We have the scriptures of old. We have eternal life. We're the chosen people. Jesus says, no, you don't have the word abiding in you. You need to be searching the scriptures. That was the problem. How do we today know for sure that we are God's people? We study the word and obey it. Not by what man tells us, not by what we feel, but what the Word says and by our obedience to it. Jesus is rebuking the Jewish people here that all of this time they think we're the people of God, we have eternal life. He's telling them, no, you, got, you have the Scriptures in hand. Yes, that's good, but you don't, you don't search them. You know what that's equivalent to today? Having a Bible in your house but never opening it and reading it. Same idea. You have the Scriptures, but you're not studying it. What good is it doing? Collecting dust? Being pretty on a coffee table? When we have events like births and deaths, we write in the front or the back of it. Maybe it looks good on a bookshelf. Maybe it's a gift that somebody gave me and, it was, and maybe I gave them. Friends, if we don't search them, what good is it doing for us? How are we going to know for sure that when a preacher gets in the pulpit back here or, I stand, or another person stands behind here and they get up and teach us a class, how are we going to know whether or not those people are telling us the truth if we haven't searched the Scriptures to find out? The noble Bereans, what did they do? Search the Scriptures daily, whether those things were so, Acts 17, 11, right? Daily. They were regular ones who were Bible students. The Jewish people, by large, were not. Now, that's a sad commentary. They had those Old Testament Scriptures in their possession, but they would, and literally, from what I've understood, they would take them out periodically, and they would actually pass them along. People just wanted to touch them. They thought, again, this was a, they just wanted to put their hands on it, touch them. He's, he's telling them, no, that's not it. Search them. Use them. I mean, it's not a decorative piece. It's not something to hold up and you start to touch. And Use it. The Word of God needs to be used. You want to know one of the most beautiful sights you can see? There's a Bible that's worn out because somebody's been using it. That's a beautiful sight. Oh, and don't get me wrong. Um, I'm not saying if you have a new Bible and it hasn't been worn in good yet that I, I'm trying to condemn you. That's not what I mean at all. But I think you understand where I'm coming from. If you find somebody that has a Bible that's coming to pieces, the pages are coming out, some of them, are, 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 they're so stained with the oil from our, our hands and everything like that, that's a beautiful sight because that person has been searching the Scriptures. It hasn't been just sitting on a desk somewhere not being used. Oh, yes, and they love, absolutely, they love the Scriptures. So he tells them plainly, Ye have not his word abiding in you, for whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. And who, did his, who was sent? That was obviously the Christ. So he tells them, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, search the Scriptures. Don't just hold on to them. Don't just ex revere them, if you will, for having them in possession. Search the Scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. One more thing before I leave that. How many of you have ever heard somebody say, oh, the word about the Bible is just too hard to understand? You heard that? Very popular in the world out there. You know what basically it is, right? And I know people are going to think I'm maybe a little coarse on this or a little, but I'm going to be very firm on it. You know what it is, right? Okay. That's basically where I'm going with it. Right. But you do well enough. And that's kind of where I'm going from it. All that basically is most of the time is an excuse not to do it. It's not that it cannot be understood. Would you think Jesus would tell them to search it out? And then when they got to it, they couldn't understand it? Absolutely not. What about us? Do you think he'd want us to study God's Word and then at the end of it say, well, I never can't understand that. No good for me. Doesn't make any sense. Doesn't make any good nonsense. Too many pages. Too many pages. All right, yeah, too big a book. I don't want to read all that. We really think we don't serve a God who's going to judge us. Buy that book. That's exactly right. Shelley makes a great point. God's not going to give us the Scriptures, and we're going to be held accountable to them, John 12, 48. That's what we have to make sure we follow, because Jesus is going to judge us by it. Do we really think God would have given it to us and then said, okay, you have to be accountable to it, but you can't understand it? That's nonsensical. The Bible is written, from what I understand, on about an 8th grade reading level. And that may be even getting lower than that now because of some of the reading levels some of these young kids are at a certain level nowadays. It may be closer to 6th or 7th grade by the time some of us die. Yes, ma'am. 
So it's down to the fifth already, as far as the schools have advanced to some of that? No doubt about it, we ought to. It, it, and don't get me wrong, are there some things that, 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 that have to have more study than others, maybe, because they're deeper studies? Sure. Uh, Peter talked about how that there were some things that Paul wrote that were hard to be understood. But he also said the reason for part of that was that people rest the other scriptures too. They struggle with them too. Now, Paul might have had things that were hard to be understood, but they could be. Oh, they... It, Absolutely. And at the end of the day, when judgment takes place, and who's going to be the judge again in this chapter, verse 22, who's the judge? Jesus is. At the end of the day, when he's there on the judgment seat, and we stand before him, and we give an account of the things done in our bodies, whether they be good or evil, and he opens the book, John 12, 48, and holds us accountable to it. So if you will, we are without excuse too, just like the Jews. That's good. You can't. Not adequately, no, sir. No, you can't. And that's something popular, too. Yeah, that's popular, too. Now that's a popular thing in the denominational world. Right. And denomination means the big It is, isn't it? Okay. Part of the whole. But the thing is the inward man, not the outward man that man sees, uh, even though if you've got the inward man, it makes the outward man. Okay, well, that's a good way of looking at it because I was thinking as you were saying that it will come out with the outward man too in regard to the fruits that you'll see them perform and the things they do and say, but that all comes from inside too. And that comes from correcting that through the word of God. The inward man becomes what he's supposed to be. That's so, a, that you, I know you've heard it in sermons many, many times. I've read it in doctor's offices where the little boy went with his daddy to the doctor or whatever, and there was a picture, and he was just aggravating Right. He said, I knew if I could get the, the man right, I got the picture right. Okay, all right. That's a good way of looking at it. And that's what the Word of God helps us to do is to get it right. So when God looks upon us, we're not disjointed. We're not out of shape. We're not where we don't need to be. We're where we need to be, exactly as it should be. That, it'll help us to be the way God wants us to be. We'll be right. Now, take a look at it carefully there again at verse 39 at the latter part. We haven't gone to search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. You understand what that means with me, right? Look at the latter part of the verse and keep in mind where all this context is and what started it. The healing of the man on the Sabbath day, right? The fact that he made himself equal with God, right? All of that is the background to this. Verse 18, uh, the fact that it's a Sabbath day and making himself equal with God. That is what we have as the background for this. So what does he say about the scriptures? For they are they which testify of me. You are without excuse. If you had searched the scriptures the way you should, if you'd studied them the way you should all these years, you would have been ready for me. They are they which testify of me. There's a witness of Christ. That's okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. In, in a sense of making sure. That's right, making sure. And I, you're not offending me with that, really. You're not. Matter of fact, I, I, some people might, might say, well, when you're up there preaching and you give a scripture reference, does it bother you when you hear people opening it? No. Those pages opening in Bibles are a good sound to a preacher. People are studying. They're looking. They're examining. They're making sure. I want people to know. I've even said it. I've even been so uh, forward with it at times. I've, made, I've said that type of thing from the pulpit. Don't just take me at my word. I have tried to encourage that. Make sure. I'm a human being. I can make a mistake. I can mess it up. Absolutely. So Jesus is trying to get the point across to them. You reject me because I performed a miracle in healing the man, and it was nothing wrong with that to begin with. He didn't violate the law of God. You don't like the fact that, I t that he told the truth, that he's the equal with God the Father because he's the Son. So you reject all these things. The problem is, if you'd been searching the Scriptures all along, if you'd been studying them the way you should, you would have had a witness already for this. You would have been ready when, I, when he came because they were telling of him all along. What's the first prophecy, if you will, pro that we can... Probably, if you want to say that, I think I, I said probably, but I'm, I'm more comfortable with saying that it is a prophecy of our Lord coming into this world. It goes all the way back to Genesis 3, 15. From that point forward in the garden... 
when man sinned, from that point forward up until Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know what the Bible's about? Jesus is coming. That's it. The Old Testament, when you get right down to it, is the Messiah's coming, the Savior's coming. You come to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, guess what you find? He's here. The Messiah made it. He's here. When you get to Acts through Revelation, you know what that means, right? He's coming back. He's coming again. That's the way you can remember the Bible in a very shortened way. Genesis through Malachi, he's coming. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he was here. Acts through Revelation, he's coming back. That's a very simple way of looking at the Bible. And by the way, that's no, not, not a bad thing to do because we are to handle the right or rightly divide the word, and that is dividing it rightly. You have the Old Testament bringing us to Christ. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, he's here, and then he's coming back. So he tries to get them to understand they are without excuse. They should have looked at the, her, the Scriptures. They had witness. They had John as a witness. They had Jesus' works as a witness. They have the Father as a witness. They have the Scriptures as a witness. And they're rejecting him. How many witnesses do they need before they get across and they understand this is the Son of God? This is the Christ. It is He who we should be hearing. Oh, sure. They had their own idea like a lot of folks today do. And I know what you're trying to say there. He is King of kings and Lord of lords, but they were thinking from a physical point like Solomon of old and all his grandeur and pomp and circumstance. That's what they were looking for. Not a supposed carpenter's son. Not a common man that was working that wasn't very seemly. And all. And that wasn't what they were looking for. But Jesus made it clear that they, these scriptures are they which testify of me. And then he says, And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. You have all these witnesses. You have sufficient evidence to support. And you won't come to him that ye might have what? Life. In him was... The life of, in him was light, and the light was the life of men. Or with that, am I saying that right? Let me make sure I read that right. I won't give you the wrong thing. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, John 1, 4. That's how it goes. All right, with that being said, I receive not honor from men. Is Jesus doing all this just so people will dote on him and lift him up physically and, and brag on him and pat him on the back? Is that what he was doing it for? No. I received not honor from men, and that's the Jews weren't giving him honor. Not by large, some of them weren't. But I know you that ye have... Now, I told you earlier, he cut them to the quick when they said, For him, for whom he hath sent, ye, him ye believe not, they cut, or that his word was not abiding in you, as, rather, verse 38. He had cut them to the quick, right? He does it again. But I know you that ye have not the love of God in you. Ooh, now he's cutting. <laughs> There are some people sometimes who believe a preacher or a Bible class teacher is not supposed to sound authoritative. That he should not be up there boldly proclaiming things and, and making points that are strong that will upset people. And Friends, I can't be an adequate Bible teacher. I cannot be an adequate preacher if I don't preach that which will prick the heart of man. In Acts chapter 2, Peter stood up and preached the gospel for the first time. They were pricked in their heart. Why? Because he told them, you killed the Messiah. You want to go back to his sermon, friends. That's what it's about. Jesus was coming, and you killed him. He was the one who was coming of the seed line of David. You killed him. Men and brethren, what shall we do? Did he tell them, don't worry about it, I don't want to offend you? He said, repent, which means you're doing wrong. You've done wrong, you need to change. Repent and be baptized, every one of you. There are times where you have to, if you will, let the Word do its job and let it cut to the quick. Yes, sir. Jesus told them that they don't love God, but they love the honor of men. Oh, that is what, that's exactly right. They do want it. Jesus was not doing it, but that's exactly what they want. You're right, dear. 100% right. I receive not honor from him. That's what they, the Jews and Pharisees especially, they loved having that. Now, if I'm up here preaching and I use the Word of God to emphasize something going on in your life that you are doing wrong and it upsets you because I preach the truth on that, that it's wrong and that you need to change from it and it upsets you and you get mad at me and you don't want to talk to me for two weeks and you go tell everybody else about how bad Corey was and he did this type of thing, is that right, the right reaction? Did Corey do anything wrong then? Now I could, in my attitude, I could be wrong in that. But the Word of God's been preached right with the right attitude behind it, with the right purpose behind it. Did the preacher do anything wrong there? You know who you're really mad at? 
You're mad at God because the Word did its work. You're mad because the Word cut to the quick. It pricked your heart. It bothered you. And the truth of the matter is, Jesus did the very same thing. What was that? You think so? Mad itself? Don't want to accept the truth? Right. Oh, no, you want to feel comfortable in your sin. A lot of folks do, absolutely. He didn't like it either. Nope, didn't like it. Uh, when you get right down to it, that happens all too often, though. But does it matter? Does it matter that you get upset about it? Oh, well. It matters to your soul. Right, it should lead you to repentance, 2 Corinthians 7.10. It should cause... Your soul, but it does not change the truth. No, not a bit. And should the preacher change it to make you feel better? Is the Bible class teacher never does he need to say, we'll just skip over that and we won't touch that? They did. <laughs> they did. Uh, they, they were very careful in making sure who was coming in here. And by the way, I'm honored to be here. Uh, following in the footsteps of Bobby Gayton as a gospel preacher is... That's a, that's, a, that's a duty and a job there because he did a fantastic job. And to have the honor to come behind him and to work with this congregation, it's a blessing. And I'm grateful for it. At the end of the day, Jesus, though, is making them understand exactly what we've been trying to emphasize. You reject me. You don't want to hear what I have to say. You don't want to listen to what I'm doing. You don't want to see the good works I'm performing. You want to reject all of this. And all along, you were without excuse. You had everything to tell you I was coming and I'm here and you reject it. And in the process, he says, I know you that you have not the love of God in you. What does that mean? If you what? Love me, keep my commandments. John 14, 15. Are they keeping the word of God? Are they abiding in it? Are they ser Nope. So guess what Jesus said? You don't have the love of God in you. That's cutting to the quick. I can, almost, I can almost hear it. There's somebody out there listening to a preacher say that, and they're getting mad at the preacher. How dare him claim that I ain't got the love of God in me? You keeping his commandments? I don't want to talk about that. Right. They want God as love. They want God, gracious God. They want a merciful God, but they don't want him as a consuming fire. They don't want him to be the one who's going to bring judgment. They don't want that. There you go. Yeah, that's right. Uh, <laughs> I'll leave that alone. I mean, I think we'd get myself in trouble. I better leave that alone. All right, but I know you that you have not the love of God in you. I am come, here it comes, I am come in my Father's name, and what? You receive me not. You keep rejecting me. You have all these witnesses. You have all this evidence. If another shall come in his own name, what did he say? Him you will receive. Friends, you know what? He was absolutely right. How many people out there today come in their own names because they don't teach the Word of God the way they should? They don't come with the authority of God. They come with their authority. I feel like it ought to be this way. I think God will accept this. I like it this way. Are they doing it according to his authority? And at the end of the day, they're doing it according to their own wills. That individual, guess what people do by large? They welcome them in. Look at these so-called mega churches, they call them out there today, who let everybody do everything they want, how they want, when they want, without any repercussions whatsoever. They're flocking to them like it's a, the w most wonderful thing in the world. You teach them the Word of God... He ain't very loving. He needs more grace. He needs more grace. He needs more mercy. Yes, sir. Oh, it is. And that's exactly what they want it that way. It's easy. If you another shall come in his own name, his own is another authority besides God's. He came in the Father's name by the Father's authority. He came to do the Father's will, his will. Another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Jesus was absolutely right. It is abundant today. But back then it was too for the Jews. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another? And that's what they did. And seek not the honor that cometh from God only. How, what do you want to be more... Uh, how, what, what's higher on your list here? Being popular with man or being popular with God? What's your, what's your, which one do you want? 
Seven and a half billion almost on this earth. Every one of them could love me and think I'm the best thing since sliced bread. I'm not doing the will of God. I'm not following His Word. I'm not receiving Him. I'm not doing what He wants and accepting the witnesses. I'm not searching the Scriptures. What is that going to get me on Judgment Day? Now, let me put it to you this way. Every one of us as Christians, forget for a moment, Corey is a preacher. I'm a Christian just like you, okay? Every one of us as Christians, every single one of us, all that shall live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 3, 12. Everybody that's a Christian lives faithfully, righteously, it's going to happen. You're going to have individuals not like you standing for what's right. You're going to have family members and friends wanting you to accept what they believe and what they do and try to get you to accept, uh, compromise on it. You're going to have people that think that you are not loving the way you should be because you will not accept certain actions that are sinful and say it's okay to do them. You're going to have those things probably happen as a Christian if you do what you need. How can you receive honor, or how can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? I don't want man's honor. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm, I don't want everybody to hate me. I don't just seek that. I don't just go out there for the fun of it and say, let's just make everybody mad that they hate me. But at the end of the day, I have to say what God said, do what God said, and if man gets mad about it, so be it. I'm more worried about pleasing God. She might have had a question. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. Oh, wait a minute. Wait, wait, whoa, 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 whoa. He's, he's given all these witnesses to back up what he's saying. He's told them you, believe, that you don't have the word abiding in you, verse 38. You don't have the love of God in you, verse 42. You, if another comes, you receive him. You won't receive me. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. That can be, he's, he's, he anticipates what they might say. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. It was, what law were they living under? The law of Moses. Who was considered the redeemer of the old nation of Israel? Moses. Who was the one, I know he didn't take them into the promised land, but led them for 40 years in the wilderness? Moses. They accepted him. They revered him. They thought well of him. Jesus says, Don't, do not think that I accuse you of the Father. The one that's going to accuse you, and I'm paraphrasing, is the one you trust. Moses. Why? For had ye believed Moses, and if they, by the way, what were, what were the, the parts of the old law again? Part of them were written by who? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Who wrote them? Moses, by inspiration. The law of Moses. What, what had they not been searching and, and studying? The Scriptures, the Old Testament scrolls that they had possession of. He told them, you don't search them out. They are they which testify of me. Moses wrote about Jesus. Who do we think wrote Genesis 3.15 that of the seed of woman he was coming to defeat Satan? Who do we think wrote Genesis 49.10 that the scepter would not depart from Judah until Shiloh come? Moses. Jesus makes it clear to them, if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. They are without excuse, and he's not taking anything from them acceptable for their reasons for not doing what's right. He's not ugly, friends. He's not rude for the sake of being rude. He's not just trying to stir the pot just to stir the pot, but he ain't giving an inch either when it comes to the truth. Not one inch. If you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. He wrote on more than one occasion. He also wrote about that prophet that was going to come that was like unto him. They were supposed to listen to him when he came. Guess who that was? Jesus, and they weren't doing it. By the way, one of the things I had to do, and this may not be much to you in regard to um, usefulness, but it's something I'll bring out to you. One of the things I had to do when I was in the Memphis School of Preaching was I had to write a paper on the fact that it was able, Moses was actually able to write because there are some people who try to say that back then they didn't have the means to do that and everything. I actually had to show that that's true. Jesus verified it right there. Moses wrote of me. I mean, they had the opportunity to write back then. It may not be exactly the way we do it today, but they had the ability. But if you believe not his writings, that would, by the way, what are his writings? The Scriptures, verse 39. But if you believe not his writings, in other words, you don't have the word abiding in you, verse 38. You don't have the love of God in you because you're not keeping the commandments, verse 42. If you believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? You reject what he said and you trust in him. How are you going to trust me? Can't be done.
Have I brainwashed any of you? you there will. There are people that will. Yes, they'll say that while well, y'all are just brainwashed. Do you know what has washed my brain? I'm going to tell you. You know what really has washed through my brain? The Word of God. When I started reading it and studying it and seeing it, man didn't tell me what God did. I didn't just trust what man said. God did. And if I'm brainwashed by God's standard, then so be it. Nothing wrong with it. No. That was trying to get them rooted and grounded in the faith. Unfortunately, that's a lot of folks don't understand that, but that's how you root them and ground them in the faith. You nurture them and you bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 4. That's part of it. That's not brainwashing. Matter, by the way, at the end of the day, if they want to call me brainwashed by God, so be it, but I'm going to be judged by Jesus on the day of judgment, and he's going to see whether or not I've done his will or not, not theirs. But you know what basically that is, too. It's just another excuse to attack you instead of doing what they need to do. Oh, yeah. That's exactly right. Roman Catholicism thrived for a while because of that very thing. They kept the Word of God out of people's hands. Didn't want man having a copy of the Bible. Why? Because you could search it and you could find out whether what they were saying was true. All right, I've got to stop Dale. I've gone over a little bit. Any questions or comments? Love studying the Word with you. Thank you for your time.